We are continuing our studies on the seven churches described in the book of Revelation. These seven churches are descriptive of churches throughout the centuries since the inception of these churches when the Holy Spirit ascended up, uh, when, when Jesus Christ ascended up into heaven in the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit descended. So these seven churches, as I've alluded in several uh, Sundays, these are real churches with real people located in the real city spread out in the ancient Asia Minor, which is today modern-day Turkey. So that this is the exact location of those seven churches. And these seven churches received a personal letter, not a text, not an email, a personal letter from Jesus Christ through the penmanship of the Apostle John. So that these seven churches will describe to us throughout history the literal implications and significance of their characteristic through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ. It started with chapter 2 of Revelation and it ended up in chapter 3. And you will notice that every time you look at the book of Revelation, you come across with seven churches. It reminds you that the book, the holy book, it's not man-made. It was written by man through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And they are real words with real people, real places, and a lot of lessons to learn because it was Jesus who described the seven churches. Look at that. Have you been to Turkey? How many of you have been to Turkey? What about Greece or Italy? Greece, Italy, Turkey, you got Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Egypt, and Libya. This is the modern translation of the ancient Asia Minor, the modern Turkey. And I am so blessed just to share it with you. Now let's go to the question and answer we made. The seven letters are from whom? Kanino po galing yung seven letters? From the Lord Jesus Christ. To whom are these letters addressed? To the believers, to the seven churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. To whom did Christ give the words to write the scroll? The next slide, kapatid. They are written by the Apostle John. And who is this Apostle John? The gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the letters in the epistle, the first, second, and third John, and the writer of Revelation. The same John who stood on the cross with Mary, who received this request from Jesus, Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. That was the same John who wrote this. And Jesus described himself in chapter 1, a wonderful a wonderful promise to us. Blessings, real spiritual well-being, a deep inner joy. That blessing is to those who read, to those who hear, and to those who obey or keep those things which are written in it. So we are studying the book of Revelation not just for information, like the KTIS would say, not just information but transformation. We need to have a transformed life based on the reading, hearing, and obeying of God's Word. Now, the next slide will tell us how these letters were constructed. Not all of them are uniformly constructed, but there are bits and pieces. But the, but the common one is the description of the author. Who is the author? Jesus Christ. And he will describe himself in many descriptive ways. Some of them are titles. Some of them are his attributes. Not only, not only there is a character in that, in that uh, 
in that letter, there is also a commendation, the positive aspects, the affirmation, the condemnation, the negative criticisms. Then there is a command and consequence, there is a call, and there is a promise reward, and then always close with the word, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Then the next slide will tell us the general description of who this writer is, or the author, which is to the Apostle John and all the churches, Jesus, that is his name. Jesus, uh, one of the many titles of Jesus is, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Greek alphabet. Alpha meaning, I am the beginning, Omega meaning, I am the end. I am which is, I am which was, and I am which is to come. Not bounded by time. This is the same Jesus who was crucified on the cross. He is the Almighty God. He is He that lives, who died, and He rose again, and He lives forevermore. Isn't that wonderful to know? That this is, this is the Lord Jesus Christ who wrote to these seven churches. And how did Jesus Christ describe himself to the seven churches? At Ephesus, he was the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden candlesticks. At Smyrna, the first and the last who was dead and came to life. The same Jesus. At Pergamum, he who has the sharp two-edged sword, the word, the living word. At Theathira, he is the Son of God who has eyes like flaming fire and his feet like a brass. Last Sunday, we learned that Jesus Christ described himself in Sardis as he who has the seven spirits of God. Not that God has seven spirits, he has only one Holy Spirit, the completeness of the Spirit and the seven stars. Today, we're going to learn his description, and that's why this is just the first part of this letter at Philadelphia. There are so much that will encourage us, beginning at the descriptions of the author and what Jesus Christ saw at the believers at Philadelphia. He is holy, true. He has the key of David. He is the one who opens and no one will shut, and he is the one who will shut and no one open. He is Jesus Christ. Shall we all rise and read all together the passage we're going to study in the next slide? Let's read it all together. Shall we all stand? Read. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He, Jesus Christ, who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold. I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have little power and you have followed my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. I will make them come and bow down before your feet and make them that I have loved you because you have kept my word of perseverance I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that the hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold firmly to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of the heaven from my God and my name, my new name. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Heavenly Father, may you add blessing to the reading of your word. We humbly request the Holy Spirit to explain to us the meaning of what we have read. Hide thy servant in the cross of Christ. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you and be seated, please. The next slide will tell us the simple outline 
of that passage founded that city founded by Attalus and built as a gateway to the east to spread the Greek culture at that moment. And the outline is the author describing himself, the commendation, and there is no condemnation, no negative criticisms, and then he gave them the promise, the divine promises and assurance. Now let's move on to the next slide. What is the city look like? And where is the city, ancient city of Philadelphia located, right? The word Philadelphia, just like what we have in the United States, it means the lover of his brother. So that the ancient Philadelphia, not the city of Philadelphia we have right now, is located in Kogamis River in Western Asia Minor, which is the modern-day Turkey, 80 miles east of ancient Smyrna or Izmir, and 30 miles southeast of Sardis. So that Sardis and Philadelphia are neighbors. They were the two churches that had no condemnation. And you probably, by now, you see, ah, that's why they are sharing. They probably fellowship most of the time, right? Philadelphia was known for its variety of temples and worship centers. But today, Philadelphia is known in the Turkish city called Alasehir. Alasehir. That is the modern name of Philadelphia located in modern-day Turkey. Due to a series of ancient earthquakes, there isn't much left of ancient Philadelphia. And archaeology is limited to the foundation stones of few Roman columns. So that Philadelphia was founded about 189 or 190 BC by a man named Attalus who was king of Pergamos, and he came over and founded this city. He had very much unusual love for his brother. And because of Attalus' unusual love for his brother, the name sticked in that city, and that's why it's called Philadelphia. Philadelphia was rich in agriculture. Noticeable elements of volcanic ash because it was very near. Very active volcanic line. Maybe just like Mayon Volcano or Daraga Albay kind of thing. The city actually stood on a hill, on a slope of a hill looking over a long valley. And it had experienced numerous earthquakes. The people who lived there were devastated on many occasions by massive earthquakes that literally destroyed the ancient Philadelphia and it was rebuilt on a number of occasions so that the city was located on a trade route called Imperial Post Road where the mail went. That is Imperial Post Road where the mail went, where all messages went. It was an Imperial Road stopped throughout the first century AD, even now when this letter is being written. So that in AD 17, a powerful earthquake destroyed 12 cities in the area, including both Sardis and Philadelphia. So when John was writing that, it was a rebuilt city. So it would have been rebuilt by the time during the writing in AD 96. The people lived in fear for earthquakes. Could just imagine the volcanic eruption and earthquakes combined. And so Emperor Tiberius helped to rebuild Sardis and Philadelphia. And so they erected a monument for Emperor Tiberius. And we might say that that place shook a lot, but Philadelphia stood firm. Let's get to know the author. The next slide, please. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write he, referring to Jesus Christ. Who is this author? He is Jesus Christ because he is holy. He is true. He has the key of David. He is who who opens. He who opens and no one will shut. And he who shuts and no one opens. Wow. Play of words? No. Hang in there. He is called the Holy One, right? 
This is the description to His holiness, to His sovereignty. The next slide, please. And His authority. He is called the Holy One in Old Testament. A number of them in Isaiah. To whom they will compare me, that I will be His equal, says the Holy One. 4515 of Isaiah. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Psalm 16, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Finally, in Habakkuk chapter 3, God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens. And the earth is full of His praise. This is the author, the Holy One. Jesus is called the Holy One. Jesus is identified as holy, absolutely sinless. Absolutely unstained, unblemished, flawless. So that in Revelations 4, 8, the four living creatures are singing and worshiping, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It is the character of the triune God. It described this triune God as holy, separate from sin. Holy means separate. Separate from what? Separate from sin. The word holy means separate, and Jesus is utterly separate from sin. Yes, he lived on earth, but he was sinless. Yes, earth is sinful, but Jesus Christ did not wallow in sin. He provided deliverance from sin. Not only he is true, the next slide will tell us that Jesus Christ is true. Jesus is the author of truth. Jesus is the embodiment of truth. Talking about our 21st century, you watch the news, you go Facebook, you can never tell whether it's true. It's depressing. But when you go to Jesus Christ, Jesus he is the author of truth. He is the revealer of truth. He looks at Philadelphia and he's got the highest premium in the universe of truth. And because Jesus is the embodiment of truth, he could see this in Philadelphia. Here is Philadelphia, a church who embraced holiness and who embraced truth. And that is why Jesus Christ says, when Jesus Christ described himself in John chapter 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And anyone who comes to the Father will pass through me. There's something in that word. If you have a friend whose name is Aletheia, that is the Greek name for the word English, truth. So Aletheia is truth. True is Alethenos. It carries the idea of genuineness, authentic, and real. It is opposed to fake. It is the opposite of fake. It is the opposite of unreal. So that Alethenus is, this is a one who is true, who is genuine, who is real. The true Messiah, the true Son of God, the genuine God. The one who is truth. And, everyone, and everything he says is true. And everything he does is truth. Because he is the embodiment. Of truth. So that when we confess to this triune God in the person of Jesus Christ, everything that he has is truth. That is the author of this letter. The third description of who this author is, he is Jesus Christ who has the key of David. What does it mean? 
Who has the key? Is it the literal key? No. It, it refers to the messianic significance because every time you see in the scripture the word key, it symbolizes authority. It symbolizes control. So that whoever has the key has authority. Whoever has the key has control. And whoever has the key can open the lock of the door. This is a direct reference to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, where there was a man named Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, was given the key to the treasury. In the Old Testament, they have a treasury. They have a treasure house. And someone has the key. In this case, he got the royal treasury. So it was the treasury of David because David was of the royal line. Eliakim had the key to that treasury, which means Eliakim had the authority and the control of that treasury. He can open it and look at the riches and he could shut it and no one can open it. So that the key of David then was the authority over royal riches. In a way, Jesus is saying, I am the one who has the key of David, and I am the one who can open the treasure house and pour out royal riches upon you, Philadelphia. In a way, Jesus Christ introduces himself as the one who can unlock the treasure, the royal treasure house by his sovereign authority, sovereign power, and open up its riches and pour out his royal riches, blessings to whom he chooses. He has the key to all the riches and he will dispense those riches at his own discretion. Another implication of the key of David is that this key unlocks David's house, which is the kingdom. That Jesus Christ not only is able to bless his own who are faithful and true, but only Jesus alone can open the door to let anybody enter into the kingdom. That's why in John chapter 14, no one comes to the Father except through me because he has the key. The next slide will tell us that he is not only holy, true, and has the key of David, but this description, I love this description. It's, it, it's so much like a play a play of words. He is Jesus Christ, the one who opens and no one will shut. And he is Jesus, the one who will shut and no one's open. What a description. If he opens the door to the kingdom, to someone, to a repentant sinner who confess him before men and accept him as Lord and Savior, he opens the door for that somebody, nobody can shut it. And if he shuts the kingdom to anyone who is knocking, nobody can open it. If he opens the door of blessing and pours it out, no one can shut it. And if he decides to leave it shut, no one can open it. Why? Because he has the key. And he has the control and power. So now, by, by this time, you see that without Christ, there is no salvation. Without Christ, there is no admission to the kingdom. Without Christ, there is no hope of eternal life. No one can stand against Jesus Christ's redemptive power. Without Christ, there is no real, true blessings. Everything we have right now, are all temporary. But those that are in Christ have eternity to enjoy. 
In Christ we are blessed. Remember in Ephesians, we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly. Wow, that phrase is full of encouragement. And no one can, can stand against him. Now the next slide, let's move on to what kind of church is Philadelphia? Who founded the church, right? We don't know much about this church of Philadelphia. The scripture is quiet as to who exactly founded this. But probably, Acts 19 will tell us, because of the tremendous effective ministry in Ephesus by the Apostle Paul, the word of the Lord spread out through Asia Minor, through modern-day Turkey. And so somehow, when Ephesus were blessed with the word of God, planted a church and strengthened within three years' ministry of the Apostle Paul, some people, some believers, were grateful and left Ephesus and went into the city, Philadelphia, and Sardis. That's why we have the church at Philadelphia. That's why we also have a church at Sardis. That's all, the only thing we know about the church. Wow, I'm excited to talk about the commendation. The next slide. The commendation. When you look at this passage, when Jesus Christ writes to you, Deal Philadelphia brothers and sisters. I know your deeds. Because he's an omniscient God. He knows everything, right? There's nothing hidden from him. I know your deeds. Behold, twice. Behold in eight, behold in nine. Behold, I have put you, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have, that's a commendation, number one. You have a little power. You have followed my word. Three, you have not denied my name. And fourth, you have kept my word up perseverance. I made an acronym for the commendation to Philadelphia. The word is Paul. As in Paul, P-O-L-E. P stands for power. O stands for obedience. L for loyalty. And E for endurance. The next slide will tell us that Jesus affirms the positive actions, I know your deeds. And that's why I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. That's the first paragraph. Maybe Jesus means that the open door of salvation and maybe the open door of blessing and rich treasure spiritually. But it's also very possible that Jesus Christ opened a door of spiritual opportunity, spiritual opportunity for service, for evangelism for reaching out others throughout Asia Minor because of the passage in verse 9. And Jesus describes a marvelous evangelistic work in verse 9. And maybe that is the answer to the question, open door of what? Open door of salvation, open door of blessing and rich treasure, but above all, it could also be an open door of spiritual opportunity of service and evangelism. Even in modern time, in the olden time, in the ancient times, when God gave through the Holy Spirit spiritual giftedness, He wants you to use it. He wants you to belong to a church and use your spiritual giftedness. And that's why I believe if Jesus Christ made a roll call, Jesus Christ would say, what about you, Riani? Yes, Lord Jesus, I have a gift in singing, and I am using it in the praise and worship team of New Life in Christ Fellowship. And yes, Lord Jesus, I am a fully bona fide member of the New Life in Christ Fellowship in Minnesota. And yes, above all, I am studying in U of M as a nurse, and I am using that vocation to reach out to others. And I am faithful. 
nice commendation, right? In any case, open door of salvation, blessing, opportunity for service and evangelization, Jesus Christ opens and nobody else can shut it. When the, when the Lord Jesus Christ calls you to share the gospel to someone after you prayed for someone, nobody can, can stop it. Why? Because this Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune God, He is sovereign. He is the El Shaddai. He is the Almighty God. He has the key of David. He opens and nobody can shut. And when he shuts, nobody can open. Why? Because he is absolutely sovereign and he is absolutely in control and he is in absolute power of this church. The next slide will tell us the first of the characteristic of Philadelphia. You have power. You have a little power. Where did we get the word power? From the Greek word dunamis. That is where we get the word English dynamite. Jesus Christ is saying you have a little power. You have a little dunamis, a little dynamite in you, in the church. Jesus is simply saying you are not a very big church. You are not very large in membership, but you got power. You got dunamis. You are small but mighty. Wonderful. This is a small church in the ancient Asia Minor, but they had some influence in the city. Why? Because they bear the name of Christ. They are not playing religion just like the Sardis, that they appear to be alive and yet they are dead. That's why the church at Sardis is, we call it last Sunday, the church of the walking dead. The church of the zombies. They appear to be moving, but they are spiritually disconnected from God. And many people right now are moving, singing, doing things, but they are spiritually disconnected from God, and that is a sad news. But the church at Philadelphia, they are not appearing alive, but they are really alive. They are regenerate people. They are born-again believer of Christ. They are part of the kingdom of Christ. That's why they had influence in the city. They have a lot of dunamis within them. You've got that power for your smallness. Small but mighty. Small but terrible. You are not very large in number, but you got power in you. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Therefore I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, the Apostle Paul wrote, For when I am weak, then I am strong. I boast about my weakness, that the power of Christ may rest in me. Sometimes, we can understand this from that 2 Corinthians 12, that in weakness, we become the weakest vessel because God wants us to deliver a greater power. The Lord makes us weak at times physically so we can deliver a great power just like the grain of a mustard. So Jesus Christ is saying, you got power, there is spiritual power flowing in Philadelphia. There is spiritual movement moving in the membership and in the leadership of that Philadelphia church. Lives were being transformed, not just being informed. Lives were being transformed. Every member, they are not perfect members, but they are being transformed by the Word of God through the Holy Spirit. 
They are mindful of their own life, individually and corporately. People were being changed because of the powerful movement in that small church called Philadelphia. Not only Philadelphia is characterized by dunamis or power, they are characterized by obedience. Jesus says, you have a little power, you are small but mighty, you have kept my word. That phrase, you have kept my word, you obeyed my word. They were bounded by the scripture, they did not deviate from the scripture, they did not compromise the scripture. Jesus Christ saying, I gave you my word and you obey it. I gave you my word and you kept it. You exactly do what I told you to do. That's why Jesus Christ, when he wrote, when he says in John 14, 23, If anyone loves me, he will obey my word. He will keep my word. He will keep my father and my father will love him and will come to him and make abode with him. Any person who says, I have religion, I attended that church, but he doesn't have a Bible, he doesn't obey the word, he is just playing church. He is a liar. Because Jesus Christ says in his word, John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, when we say, I love Jesus Christ, you will obey my word. Before you can obey the word, you have to have his word and you have to read his word and obey his word. And that's why here at New Life in Christ, we introduce the word of God at the early stage of the children. We teach them. We encourage them to memorize so they can live it out as early as they can. Not only they have power, dunamis, they have obedience, but thirdly, they have loyalty. They have loyalty. Jesus says, you haven't denied my name. You haven't denied my name. And that precludes that suppose they were under some kind of pressures from a local Jewish synagogue that's hammering them day and night. Why? Because the Philadelphia church believes in the true Messiah. Believes in the Old Testament prophesied Messiah, Redeemer, and Savior of Israel. And the local Jews, religious leaders, namely the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they hate them. They were religious, but they were lost. They hate Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ said, I know you stuck up for me. I know they are pressuring you, but you have not denied your, my name. You stood up in my name. You were faithful. Thank you. You were faithful. You were loyal to me. And I love your loyalty. Didn't matter what it cost. But Jesus Christ is saying in Revelation 14, 12, Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep, who obey the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are living in the 21st century where everything is being done to eradicate the presence of Christianity, beginning with eradicating the Word of God, eradicating this in-person worship. I don't know if it's true. I read in the Facebook that Mark Zuckerberg is encouraging an in-person worship. Don't bother going back to church because of this virus. That the Philadelphian church would say, Yes, Lord Jesus, amidst, amidst the pressure from the synagogue of Satan, amidst the pressure of COVID-19, I obey Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. I attended an in-person worship, Lord Jesus. If I may use that analogy. They were loyal to Christ. They were loyal to their church. A lot of people now are church hopping. They don't even know where their memberships are. Where is your church? Oh, I attended over there, I attended over there. But where is your church? Meaning, where do you give your loyalty? 
Oh, I'm not loyal to any church because of the. You've got to have a name of the church you are loyal with, just like the Philadelphian, just like Sardis, just like Smyrna. They were loyal to Christ and they were loyal to the church. They did persevere. They hang in there. They don't deny the Christ who died on the cross. And that's why they have dunamis because of the powerful name of Jesus. Because of the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. May I repeat again? Jesus Christ will endure forever our money, our health, our looks, our house, our car, our everything in the physical realm. They can all be gone away with fire, with flood, and anything that is beyond our control. But only your faith in Jesus Christ when you persevere, that sticks. That's what happened to the Philadelphian. They have power, they have obedience, they have loyalty, and finally they have endurance. The pole. Power, obedience, loyalty, and endurance. Verse 10, Behold, you have kept my word of my perseverance. Word of my perseverance. NIV translate this as, You have kept my command to endure patiently. You have kept my command to endure patiently. It wasn't always easy, I know, because of the pressure of the synagogue of Satan. I know it's hard most of the time, but lots of things come and in and out of the life of the church. But you, Philadelphian, you were patiently enduring, keeping my command. You're persevering. You endure through it all. Through it all, you stuck with me. You hang with me. I love you. Philadelphia Church, you were there in good times, and you were there in bad times. You did not jump ship. You stayed. You sail through rough sailing. And you enjoy the smooth sailing. If I may use that. This is a very wonderful characteristic of this church that we could emulate. The spiritual strength. The spiritual power. The obedience. The passion. The passionate endurance. It takes them in bad times and it takes them in good times. It takes them through trials and tribulation. They stick through difficulties and hardship. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself what? Displayed those, right? When he left heaven's glory, he left all the splendor. He left all the accolades of the angelic beings, the cherubims and the seraphims. And when he landed on the planet called Earth, for 33 and a half years, what did the people of the earth did to him? They crucify him. How can you crucify the creator of heaven and earth, the one who gave you life? See how sinful, how wicked people is? And even in spite of that, he died on the cross, patiently enduring with the love that has for you and me. He gave his life. Jesus endured faithfully. Jesus endured patiently until they put him on the cross. The patience and endurance of Jesus Christ is certainly our model. This COVID-19 with, with all the, the variant, the Delta, and I have heard there is a Lambda variant coming. It's wearing us out. It's stopping people from fellowship, stopping people from work, stopping people from coming together, strengthening one another. It's good here in Minnesota. We are not mandated like in the Philippines. The, the MCQ, the GCQ, and all of the Q. It's sad. Second Thessalonians 3, 5, Paul prays, May the Lord direct your heart into the love of God and into the endurance or the steadfastness of Christ. That was a wonderful prayer in 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the endurance, the steadfastness of Christ. So that Jesus Christ is saying, you have kept my command to endure patiently. So this is saying that to become born again 
is easy, but to live out as a born again, as a follower of Christ, we need to endure patiently. You have kept my command, you have obeyed my command, you have followed my example of patient endurance. Please come back next Sunday when we talk about the promises because of what Jesus Christ saw in the people, the believers at Philadelphia. Matthew 10, 22, let me close in this. You will be hated by all on account of my name, says Jesus Christ. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Meaning, this is a faithful church, the Philadelphia. It is an enduring, it is a patient church. Through trials, tribulations, persecutions, Christians exemplified faithfulness. Why? Because the triune God is faithful. He has provided everything they need, including deliverance. Brothers and sisters, this is a wonderful example I hope and pray that when Jesus Christ writes a letter to the new life in Christ, he will say, new lifers, I have seen a dunamis. You have kept my word. You did not deny my name. And you patiently endure because of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your faithfulness. Dakila ka, O Diyos. Dakila ang iyong pag-ibig. Dakila ang iyong pagmamahal. 